Hey, welcome everyone. I'm Richard Herskowitz, the Artistic Director at AIFF, and uh, we have a number of people from the film that you just saw here to speak with us about the film. So uh, let's have them introduce themselves, starting with you, Melissa. Hi, I'm Melissa Fitzsimmons, and I'm the writer-director of Everything in the End. And our producer? Hello, my name is Brennan Hubbard, and I'm the producer of Everything in the End. And uh, ZP? Hi, I'm Todd Hickey, and I'm the DP. Okay, and let's welcome the star. Hi, I'm Hugo de Souza, and I play Paulo. Okay, welcome to all of you. And uh, for Melissa and Brendan, it's a return visit to Ashland Independent Film Festival. You were here, <laughs> I think, a couple of years ago? Yeah, I was there with a short called Who Decides? And uh, I'm happy to be back. Great to have you. So um, you are based in LA, is that correct, Melissa? And is that true about you too, Brendan? Uh, no, I'm, a, I'm on the East Coast, I'm in Philadelphia. Okay, well, um, tell me about just getting to Iceland and um, how uh, this project originated. Um, okay, so, um, I, when I was writing this script, I had always imagined that it was going to be in Iceland because I really wanted to shoot something there. And so I wrote with that location in mind and it was very important that the film take place on an island. So it was, it was kind of uh, important for me to kind of shoot it on an island as well. And so I had spent a lot of time in Iceland and I had, was part of a talent lab there. And so I knew that I was going to make this movie and I knew I was going to make it there. And, and I don't think it was too hard to convince everybody to go to Iceland with me, but it was definitely a selling point. I think, I hope, I, I hope so. Could you tell me about how Iceland influenced the film or inspired the story? Oh, it was definitely an inspiration. Um, so I had a thought about how if I was kind of stranded anywhere and it was the end of the world, where would I want to be? And, and one of the places that I, I had always thought of would be Iceland because everybody there is so kind and it's very, it's a very calming and it's incredibly beautiful. And so mm -hmm. I thought if I was going to spend my last days anywhere, I didn't really want to be in a chaotic environment. I would want to be kind of surrounded by this beauty and I would, I would want to be very calm about it and very just ready to go and make my peace and Island really, and Iceland really uh, gives off that vibe and that feeling, um, you know, emotionally, personally, and just physically as well. Uh, so tell me about mounting the production. I mean, it, it's, as, as I understand it, it's a very small crew and a very low budget. So um, Brendan, you were uh, pulled into the project and- uh, <laughs> You could say that. that. <laughs> Can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah. So. Basically, I was on the road. Uh, I had toured with a band and Melissa like called me up one day and she's like, I'm going to do this thing probably like in a couple months. And I was like, sure, let me know. And then a couple months went by and it was like, you know, she brought on Hugo. She brought on Todd and like everyone wants to do it. So we kind of just planned it over two months and found enough money to fly everyone there. And you know, we had a crew of five people plus uh, some Icelandic help. Mm -hmm. uh, we cast everyone like literally like two weeks before the film shot we found some airbnbs up up in the northeast and just you know we shot in nine days and every day was like let's wake up and figure this out wow so i, I want to hear a little bit about the 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 casting um hugo you are a portuguese but you're based in new york in, uh, in la in la okay yeah. I understand that you you came to the U.S. and you studied in uh, Uta Hagen's studio. That, that, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and uh, can you say something about your film acting and uh, experience and um, how you were drawn into this project? Uh, yeah, I moved to New York and I studied there for a year, and then I moved I moved to L.A. and I've been here uh, making small independent films ever since. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's kind of how I met uh, Melissa. She saw one of my films uh, and she cast me in this, yeah. Huh. I understand that you're, you've directed a film too, is that right? Yes, I did, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Tiny, mic like microscopic film, it's mm -hmm. so tiny, yeah. 
So, so tell us about uh, kind of inhabiting the character. Um, um, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I was, uh, there was a, I was just trusting Melissa. I mean, she told me the story and I had, a, I had a pretty clear idea of what she needed for, for the, for the, for the film and the tone mm -hmm. of the whole thing. And in terms of the character, uh, we just, because one of the decisions he makes at the beginning of the film is to, uh, not be alone. That, that, that's something like one of the characters tells him, like, whatever you do, don't be alone. And mm -hmm. so in order to make that more of a challenge, we decided to make him like super shy and like, and uh, shy and reserved. So that, that would be more of an obstacle uh, mm -hmm. when he meets all these people throughout the film. So that was kind of like the base of the character uh, for the character. And then I just, you know, I was just hoping that Iceland and all the other incredible actors I got to work with would affect me in an, in, a, in an interesting way, yeah. Yeah, I mean, personally, I love independent films that um, that um, blend professional actors with non-actors and scripted footage and um, improvised footage. So could you talk about that, um, both of you, Melissa and uh, Hugo, about working with non-professional as well as professional actors and drawing out your story? Maybe Melissa, you could start with you just about why you chose to do that. I th well, personally, I I don't know if there for me personally, I don't know if there's a difference between professional actors and non-professional actors in the sense of like uh, creating a character and capturing that those characters. I mean, it's professional and unprofessional or non-professional when it comes to like you know knowing how to hit your mark and all that. But that's really easily to learn. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of acting, uh, I thought everyone was great. Even the ones who had never really done anything, they were amazing and they brought, they brought themselves to the script, which is what w originally when we were casting and we were looking at Icelandic people, we had a mix um, and the way that they do things there is very different than in the States. And so you, I just had to like reach out to people through their private emails and say, would you like to do this? And then instead of auditioning and sending in auditioning tapes, I just would have them record themselves telling me a story because I just wanted to know who they were because mm. it was important that whatever story I was asking them to tell me, I wanted to know what their story was in case we could bring some of that in if this was you know, the end of the time for them. So to me, they were all professionals. Um, uh -huh. so, so, I mean, I think probably the most challenging thing in terms of like how to how I was working with them was uh, probably just the kid but it had he was probably the most professional one but he actually didn't speak English um, very well at all and so there was there was a lot going on and a lot emotionally happening and he's just a, he was a wonderful kid and you, we had to translate a lot of stuff and kind of our producer our Icelandic producer um, Thurin would like hide behind and like tell him like when he had to say things in English and stuff like that. So that was probably like the only thing in terms of like any kind of neutral chaotic stuff, but he was, he was so good and, and, and wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I think theater is like a really big thing in Iceland. And so the older actors, they'd all done theater. So, and I know Yahweh and Lilia, they had, they've done television and film. And so they came in and they knew everything and it, it wasn't really um, such an, such an issue. So, yeah. I so mean, were they working just, from scripted dialogue or kind of playing off just um, themes uh, in, in each scene? I think the majority of it was that everyone worked with was scripted, except for there were two scenes where we kind of made up on the day and it was like Hugo and um, Gunnar at the, the, the man at the beach and then um, Hugo and Raul, who was the Spanish man. Mm -hmm. So I just, with Hugo and Gunnar, I was like, this is kind of the scene that I, uh, the feeling and this is kind of what's happening and and really, let's bring it let's distill it down to like you know 
men and what they need to do to release that. And, and then they, they really went with it and they were really good. Like the fighting thing was, I believe it was Hugo's idea. Like, can we maybe fight? Originally I wanted them just to like scream at each other. Mm-hmm. And then he was like, well, what do you feel about, how do you feel like maybe we can fight, like actually fight? And I was like, oh, just don't hurt yourself. I know like, I didn't really I didn't feel good about it. Yeah, I didn't really tell yeah. the producers. And I was like, I was like, well, let's see what happens. And then I remember on the first take, Hugo goes down and there was a, a pile of rocks. And and from where we stood, it looked like he just crashed his head right into the rocks because we were farther back. And mm-hmm. and I just saw Brendan like running kind of <laughs> like just to see and and mm-hmm. and I think like that scene was like, it's one of my favorite scenes because it's so beautiful and what they did with each other. And they really played really well off each other and and yeah. same with Raul and Hugo. And I thought it was quite interesting, this kind of man from Spain and this kind of man from Portuguese and and like, you know, yeah, just this kind of connection through language, but not language, but just like kind of being there for each other was very sweet, so. Yeah, so your perspective, Hugo. Uh- when it comes to like non-actors and like professionals and non-professionals, honestly, like everyone now is so used to like performing in front of a, a camera because of social media. So you can't really tell. And, uh, and people and they get there and they're pretty excited and they're really, uh, they, yeah, they know how to do it. Uh, they're not that, you know, having a camera there, the people are used to it by now. Um, uh, when it, uh, yeah, so, and uh but yeah, it was cool because every day was like a different actor would come to set. So every day was like a different puzzle mm-hmm. uh, for, for everyone. And uh, so, yeah, and all the scenes are very different from each other. So that really kept like, you know, us like uh, excited for like, you know, to do something different. And uh, that scene at the beach was stressful because that was like a, a magic hour. Mm-hmm. So we did, we had like, I mean, 20 Living minutes to, to pull it off. And it was a long scene. So yeah. we kind of had... So we went, we tried something and hope, you know, you know, uh, I'm glad it worked because if it didn't, we wouldn't be able to shoot it again, probably. Uh, well, since, yeah. Yeah. Well, since you brought up a uh, magic hour. Let's talk to the DP. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a gorgeous film and it, it does not look like a low bu- budget film. And uh, I think you have a lot to do with that. So c- can you Thank say you. something about uh, developing the visual style uh, with Melissa for this film and ha- how you shot it? Yeah, um, Melissa and I looked at, Melissa had a great like lookbook that she created from a lot of her photographs and stuff that she had sourced. Um, so we had like a good like template to start from. And a lot of our work was was about the design of like intimacy, like trying to, so the photography in the characters earn an intimacy. So we get these wide shots of Hugo. It changed a little bit because the edit moved around. So like the way we had designed it through, throughout with like the lensing and proximity of the characters to camera and each other and how we brought them together with lensing and focal length and stuff like that. But that was really a lot of our work was designing, having a template to, in a like a playbook kind of to go in and have a plan, but that we can easily adapt from. Melissa and I have both have a lot of doc experience. And I think that really came into play in this film is Mm -hmm. being able to find the light, anticipate what characters are gonna do, sort of like work on the fly, but from a playbook. I use a lot of sports analogies. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, there's a lot of that that comes into our work. And you know, it's just like have a playbook, have a game plan, and then be able to throw it out or go back to it. And mm-hmm. that was a lot of our back and forth that we did. And I think it worked pretty well um, mm-hmm. in, in pulling it up, you know, and getting what we hoped to do, which was intimacy with Hugo and the people that he meets and this like, and the, the scale of a human against the world ending. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I um, want to talk about some of the themes of the film and how they just resonate with the present and the, the, our, our, our pandemic moments. I mean, you couldn't have anticipated this, uh, the grief and the isolation and, and the end of the world. Can, can you say something about that in terms of when you made the film and how it's playing out? Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely didn't anticipate what's happening right now. Um, we, we, I, 
you know, Brendan and I and Todd and I and Hugo and I, we'd always approach this film as we were making a movie about grief and finding some human connection in that grief and the end of the world and what's happening in the world is was always the secondary story. It was just like a backdrop. Um, and so, you know, had I known we were going to put in a pandemic was going to happen, I might have I might have put that in there. I don't know. Um, but so when we got back, because we shot this right before and we did our post all through last year. So um, it was a challenging experience just to go through post like this online with people when normally you're together and trying to figure out all the obstacles of editing and all that. But um, I, I think that the feedback that I'm getting, and I don't know about Hugo and Brendan is, is very much of like, wow, this is a really lovely film. That's a reminder that to slow down because we've been forced to slow down um, this movie is just like an affirmation of like that. It's it's very, it's been very lovely the feedback that we're getting in terms of like I, this is the film that I that this is the COVID film that I needed mm -hmm. and I didn't even know and so it's been really lovely. Um, you know I've been very careful not to say oh we've made a um, a movie in t for the pandemic because that, that's really not what we did and that was never our intention because obviously we didn't know this was going to happen so. Um, I'm glad that we, we made a movie just about human connection and during this time people are finding humans that they can connect with when they're so isolated and lonely right now, still a, a year, you know, a year later, so. Right. Well, thank you for sharing the film with our festival and uh, I know you're, you're going on to Cinequest and, and other festivals and uh, um, I, I hope uh, you get the film the distribution it, it deserves. Again, uh, thank you all for being part of our festival this year. Thank you, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you. you, appreciate it. Okay.